Whether it's the Christmas decorations you throw away every year, or those tempting Black Friday deals, the amount of things you buy may not be something that you think about much. But if you're among the world's wealthiest 10%, earning at least $38,000, it's likely you contributed to more than half of the carbon emissions added to the atmosphere between 1990 and 2015 because of your spending habits. To keep on track for the goal of holding global warming to just 1.5 degrees Celsius, it's estimated that every person in that top 10% would have to reduce their emissions tenfold and do it by 2030. Slashing emissions is even more important for the world's wealthiest 1%. A recent study by the Stockholm Environment Institute and Oxfam found that over the last 25 years, that 1% produced 15% of climate changing emissions. That's more than double the 7% emitted by the poorest half of humanity. It's being called the era of extreme carbon inequality, where the amount emitted by the world's richest leaves little room for the poor and future generations to develop. So how is excessive consumption damaging our planet? How do you address this inequality? And what habits can the richest change to help ease the climate crisis? Buying things for your basic needs like food and some clothing is necessary. But a lot of what we buy isn't, especially if we've got more money. Roughly three billion people around the world now belong to the consumer class. People with enough money to spend on things like luxury goods and the newest gadgets. By 2030, that group is expected to grow to 5 billion. So what is it about buying excessively that's so bad for the planet? Every item we buy, from clothing to smartphones, needs energy to produce or extract the raw materials, manufacture the item and ship it. Energy mostly still produced with fossil fuels. According to the UN, the surge in use of natural resources used for production accounts for half of the world's planet heating emissions. Services we purchase also have a huge impact. The biggest share of the very big carbon footprints of the world's richest people, it comes from transport. It's both buying bigger cars and driving them further. The very highest polluters is flying. There's only about 20% of the global population has ever been on a plane. Just around 1% of flyers are responsible for about half of all emissions from aviation. So why are people consuming and buying more than ever? There was a time when shopping was a chore, but it gradually became a leisure activity after malls started popping up in the 1960s. When it comes to excess consumption, retailers are usually put under the spotlight with their discount deals and special promotions. But it's also advertisements and a new generation of social media influencers that have led people to value consumption of things from cheap clothing to carbon heavy foods, even though their production has been linked to deforestation and pollution. Then there's the problem of the throwaway culture, encouraging us to constantly upgrade our gadgets and to buy things we'll only use once. It's also important to remember prices don't always reflect the costs the item has on the environment and society. Companies price their goods based on what it costs for them to produce them and to run their operations and to market the goods. But that's been really a false economy. We have known for ages that actually when we consume raw materials, when we mine minerals, we are impacting not only the ecosystem, the habitats from which those are obtained, but also the communities that are living nearby who may be, for example, dealing with wastes that are a result of those mining activities. If we had had, for example, a price on carbon that was imposed by governments, then that would be priced into the goods and services that were produced using fossil fuels, but we haven't had. So while the rich buy too much and the poor not enough, how do you address inequality when the aim is to reduce consumption? There's a limit to the total amount of climate changing emissions the global population can produce if we want to stay safe from climate change. And while the wealthy use up a large share of this carbon budget, it's others who are most likely to suffer the consequences. Carbon inequality really is a way of describing the inequality between who is responsible for adding carbon emissions to the atmosphere. But in all countries, even in rich countries as well, it's the poorer communities that tend to be on the front lines of more extreme weather, of rising sea levels. They're the ones that get affected when food prices go up as a result of droughts or floods that have damaged crops. If the carbon budget is totally used up, it also leaves no room for future generations to develop. 
we should be using the remaining carbon that we can burn to lift people out of poverty and help them to transition to a low carbon economy. To keep global climate change under control means not just helping poorer countries to develop in a clean, sustainable way, but also putting in place tough measures to curb overconsumption by the world's rich. You now have very rich people in global terms living in every continent, also in Africa, in India, in China, Brazil, Mexico, and so on. And so it is important that in those countries, the richest, highest emitters are treated the same as if they lived in the US or in Europe and are also required to reduce their emissions. There is an obligation for everyone to actually start paying what products cost, paying the real cost, and we won't get there until carbon has a price and is enforced. And the pressure for change is growing. Youth campaign group Fridays for Future organised strikes around the world, marching against overconsumption. And Extinction Rebellion led protests to urge the fashion industry to play their role in curbing climate change. Consumers' demand for greener products is also on the rise too, putting pressure on corporations to change to a circular economy, a model that aims to reuse resources with waste being recycled into new products. Companies have a role to actually deliver opportunities for responsible consumption. After all, marketing is actually what drives our aspirations and our wants not our needs. So how can we market to consumers in a way that actually they want to do the right thing and just default give the consumer something that's better? More people are educating themselves and taking action too. Many people are setting up their own community exchanges for clothes and local services and repair workshops, joining zero waste groups and using apps to distribute unused food. But changes in individual consumption habits alone aren't enough. It's important to recognise that this is a systemic problem. So the fact that we have this inequality is a result of government policies over the last 20 or 30 years, which have prioritised high carbon growth, but highly unequal carbon growth that has given more and more income to fewer and fewer people at the very top. So if we want to really tackle this at a systemic level, we have to have new government policies that will more fairly redistribute income across the population and help us to transition in a fair, in a just way to a low carbon society. Some countries have already introduced incentives to discourage excessive consumption and promote more sustainable economic growth. France has introduced tougher taxes on SUVs to lower car emissions, and the UK's first citizens' assembly on climate change has backed taxes on business class flights, private jets and frequent flyers. The global impact of the coronavirus pandemic has not only proven habits can be changed quickly, it's provided an opportunity to build back better. We've also seen emissions fall very dramatically this year as a result of the restrictions that have been imposed as a result of the pandemic. What we need now is to shift making those types of changes in a way which is just, which is fair, which protects people on the lowest incomes, which asks people on the highest incomes to do more, to do their fair share as we make this transition. Because the kinds of emission reductions that we've seen during the pandemic, that's the type of emission reductions we need to see year on year from this point forward.